Okay, we're back. So I uh, hope everybody had a chance to uh, grab some more coffee and that sort of thing. Uh, we will continue on from here. I was just reading back through the uh, the chat here. It looks like I I missed uh, a, uh, a question that was asked about uh, Clang uh, as an official tool chain for Yocto project. Uh, Dennis's um, answer is is, is uh, arguably the the uh, the most relevant in the sense that uh, it is something that that uh, are still ongoing uh, uh, discussions there. And, and indeed, he will uh, probably be the best informed there. Um, Alexander certainly uh, is correct in that uh, multi uh, having multiple compilers does does complicate uh, certain things. Certainly, the um, the uh, the build the build times needed to make sure everything works appropriately. Um, I don't want this to become a, uh, a Clang versus GCC uh, talk, certainly. Um, however, if you want to talk more about Clang, certainly, uh, and uh, generally, or indeed uh, Yocto project, the, the best thing to do is, is to, to uh, come to the social after uh, the conference today and we can talk more about that. Uh, that's, uh, that's a much bigger topic. Uh, and indeed, lots of interesting things uh, can be done there. Uh, one of one of the things that um, I've, I did in the past was I, I was uh, part of the original project to port the Linux kernel uh, from GCC to Clang and certainly can tell you a little bit about uh, some of the things that have happened there. Some really awesome things have happened in uh, recent recent years uh, surrounding uh, Clang and, and how things work together. But uh, that's beyond the scope of this particular talk. So like I said, uh, best thing to do is to, to find um, to come to the, the, the social afterwards and, and we can talk further. Uh, there, but uh, it's it's a complicated topic, and indeed, um, open embedded and uh, Yocto project, um, uh, of course, uh, have some some difficult uh, decisions in, in order to decide whether or not to uh, include it, because uh, it's not a simple a simple answer. But getting back to the, the talk here, let's uh, let's look at the various tasks that come in along with with recipes. Um, and again, these are not the exact tasks you'll find for every single recipe, but for many of them, this is what they have. These are the the steps that that are used in order to build these. This is not every single task. Again, not every recipe has these tasks, but these are uh, are, are fairly common uh, across sort of normal. Uh, software build, um, the software build that comes with a particular recipe. And that is, there is uh, uh, tasks for fetch, unpack, patch, configure, compile, install, populate, sysroot, and package. And again, there are other ones as well. Uh, there's actually underscores between all of those um, letters. The, uh, the formatting just kind of uh, puts the underscore into the white area underneath the box. Um, you will find that the the conventional way, or at least the way that that uh, you're uh, you are um, made to name tasks when you provide them as a part of your recipes, is uh, the naming convention of do underscore and then the name of the task that you're you're providing. Um, the way you write your own tasks is you create uh, a routine called that within your recipe, and then you, you use a a, a a command called add task, and and uh, then provide the uh, whether it's before or after another task, so you can provide dependencies, um, not within the scope of this particular uh, uh, um, presentation, but indeed you can in fact add or modify existing tasks uh, uh, if you so wish within your recipe. Again, almost anything is possible within within a recipe. Um, now, what does each one of these tasks do? Well, do fetch does exactly what it sounds like. It's the fetcher. Uh, it's the thing that goes out uh, based on the uh, source URI that you provide. It's a, a, a variable that we're going to look at in a moment. Uh, it will then use the appropriate code to go and find and, and download or, or uh, make available the source code that, that you, you've uh, specified within your metadata. And there are fetchers for most source code repository systems, certainly for local code, for, for Git, for Subversion, uh, and, and many others as well. In fact, um, you will find that uh, that is possible if, if there isn't a fetcher for a particular way of getting source code that you need. In fact, writing one is not uh, horribly difficult. And indeed, there, there are fetchers for most things that you can think of out there. And again, depending on how your source code comes, uh, if it comes as a part of, let's say, a tarball or a zip file or something like that, 
uh, there may be a uh, an optional unpack step, one where you take that input format and uh, uh, change it into a series of files in, in source code directory. And so that's the unpack step. Um, again, there's a, another task after that called the patch task. And again, uh, you may have a series of patches that are provided as a part of your metadata. Uh, again, uh, as a part of the list of, of things that make up your source code in the source URI, um, you'll find that anything that ends in dot patch will automatically be patched on top of whatever the source code has been unpacked from your fetch step. Um, the way this is done internally is it uses a, a system called Quilt. There's a, um, a, uh, a patch management system called Quilt, because of course there is. Uh, it's, a, it's a great patch management uh, mechanism, well worth learning. Uh, and it will, it will basically layer those patches on top of whatever source code you've downloaded. Again, providing patches is something that sometimes has to happen. Perhaps you need to change the source code because of policy or uh, your compiler is different or, um, or whatever, maybe different versions of libraries you want to use or, or whatnot. Uh, there's a number of reasons for adding patches on top of upstream source code. Uh, again, if you can upstream a patch, that's better, but sometimes you can't, and this is where you put it. Uh, next, we have the configure steps. Again, not every build system has a configure step, but if you're using autoconf, there's a dot slash configure that needs to happen with optional parameters and whatnot. And again, you can uh, you, you can essentially uh, provide those parameters to the configure step to make it work appropriately. Again, that will make more sense when we look at some of the, some examples later on. Uh, next, we have the compile step. So uh, this will this is where our source code is ultimately uh, uh, ultimately run through the compiler. And once that's finished, of course, there's an install step. And this installs something, as installs the results, pardon me, in, into a staging area, which is then used to uh, to build packages and whatnot. Uh, you'll find that, in fact, there are two things that come after the install. One is called populate sysroot. The other one is, is do package. In the case of populate sysroot, what this is going to do is it's going to copy the artifacts from the build that are required to build against this as a dependency. In other words, it will take things like header files, uh, libraries, and uh, other things required to build other things from it and put it into the sysroot uh, used by other things uh, to, to, to be able to, to build it, uh, to, to build against it, pardon me. Uh, and so uh, well, you'll find that generically a sysroot uh, is uh, often, um, the easiest way of thinking of a sysroot is, is, is the things under slash user. So when you were building source code, it's gonna look under user include, it's gonna look under user lib to find the things that are there. Uh, you'll find that when you're you're cross compiling for a target, you need to provide something similar, but for the architecture that you're building for. Uh, in the Octo project, we have per recipe sysroots. Uh, we actually build a sysroot per recipe to make sure that all dependencies are appropriately handled. Um, and so the populate sysroot will will effectively then take the output of the build and then put it uh, into the uh, the appropriate sysroot for dependent uh, projects. Again, I'm somewhat oversimplifying, but that's the that that's the the simple way of thinking about it for the moment. And then finally, do package. This is going to in parallel take the output of the build and and build it into a series of packages such that they can then be used to build uh, images later on. And again, to, to get a list of all tasks that are uh, possible for a particular recipe, you can do a minus C list task on the name of the recipe. It will then list which uh, recipe, uh, which tasks that are there. It will list them as do underscore whatever. Uh, you would you would strip off the do underscore portion to use it with the minus C, however, uh, with with the command line. When you actually run BitBake, it will actually uh, show you a number of different tasks. Now, in this particular case, uh, we're, we're showing them to you uh, sequentially, uh, as, as you would see in the um, uh, in, in the cooker log. Uh, normally, uh, if you're on an interactive command line, of course, you'll see them list uh, above, or rather, they'll be listed in a series of parallel things that, that, that happen underneath. If you redirect it to a file, however, you will see the sequential uh, list of things as as they're counting down. You'll notice that it will say uh, which task it's running out of out of a total number of tasks that it's calculated. It will then tell you the recipe that's running and indeed the task that's currently running for it. And so uh, 
basically every task required across every recipe it needed it will be listed in the individually and so you'll see here for this hello um, .bb file you see that the, the, the fetch is run unpack patch configure in this case it's also uh, grabbing the license we're going to um, there's a license per recipe, so it's it's doing that. Um, compile, install, package. There, it's populating the sys root. Again, these actually happen in parallel, as does uh, these two. Uh, here, it's doing um, the package data. It's, it's then it's it's writing the uh, the i package file in this particular case out to the package feed, and uh, of course, doing the QA on it, looking for a potential problem. And again, there's a couple of extra tasks in here we haven't specifically talked about. We don't tend to have to think about them directly, uh, but they are other tasks that uh, that are possible to, to change or, or manipulate if, if necessary. Now, when you are building something over and over again, you will find that you often do the same things um, many, many different times. And uh, the reality is, is, is given the same inputs, you will you should get the same outputs. Um, if anybody here has ever used a utility called CC cache before, uh, the, the shared state cache or S, S state is a, a similar idea. In the case of uh, C, uh, CC cache or C cache, I guess, technically, um, what it ultimately does is it tries to make compiling individual files faster. And so just to, to talk about an analogy so we can understand how S state works, let's let's look at a, a similar idea through through C cache. Um, when you're building C code, uh, what are your inputs? Think about your inputs. Uh, it's the compiler itself, uh, the uh, environment variables that are passed into that compiler, the options passed at the command line. Uh, there's the C code itself. And of course, all of the header files or includes that are that are used. So those five things essentially um, are your inputs. Okay, given all of those things, you should get the same output. Uh, and, and what comes as output from a compile, of course, are two things. There's the .o file or whatever file comes out of that particular uh, compile chain that you've you've provided. Typically, a .o. Um, and of course, the standard error output, in other words, the text that comes out of the, the actual compile itself. In theory, given the same inputs, you should get the same two outputs. And what Ccache does is uh, the first time through compiling, it will grab the, the text output and indeed the binary output uh, of, that, of that particular uh, tool, and it will save it into its own cache such that the next time through, if you get the exact same inputs, it can just copy the .o file into place and just catch the standard error and not actually run the compile step at all. Again, given the same inputs, you will get the same outputs. S state is similar, okay, but it actually does it at a, at a higher level. So you'll see things like uh, for package data, for packaging, uh, for doing a package write, for instance, populate a license, populate sysroots. Uh, these are things where um, lots of steps before have happened. And again, given the same inputs, you should be able to jump uh, to these later, later uh, uh, outputs appropriately uh, because you'd just be recreating them anyways. So for instance, if you have a, uh, an S state uh, from a previous build you've done, instead of fetching, unpacking, patching, com uh, configuring, compiling, uh, it might directly jump to, let's say, populate sysroot, okay? So if you've got a dependent package you're, uh, you're building against, uh, instead of building it in order to, to populate your sysroot from it, it might jump straight to populate sysroot. And the reason why it can do that, of course, is because that step has been cached as part of S state such that you do not have to rebuild it in order to uh, build against that particular dependency. Uh, and again, this only happens, uh, only works rather if you've built it previously and indeed nothing has changed. Okay, as soon as something has changed, of course, it will have to rebuild that dependency. But this does mean that we can skip forward on things that we have done before where the, uh, the inputs are identical such that we can guarantee that the outputs will be the same. Now, uh, the, the, uh, more paranoid amongst you will probably say, well, how can you verify? How can you be sure that the, uh, you know, given the same inputs, the same output will always, always occur. 
And the reality is, is that when you're doing development, you can make those decisions, you can make that decision to, to use that state and indeed to, to speed things up. Uh, if you don't want to use that state, of course, you can do a clean every single time. Uh, but you will find that when it comes to CI builds, it's it's quite common to start with a, an empty F state so that it will actually build everything completely from scratch just to make sure that everything works appropriately. Uh, indeed, like I said, when you're doing your development though, it's just a whole lot easier to use um, S state, uh, especially when you're working in a team in order uh, with a shared F state in such a way that if somebody's already done the work, basically you don't have to do it again. Again, compiles take a long time the more that you can share that work between different, uh, uh, you know, to parallelize it as much as you can across even a, an entire team, the better. Uh, again, in most cases, and, and indeed in, in almost all cases, given the same inputs, you should get the same output. And S state um, allows you to short circuit that, and in fact, uh, uh, therefore getting faster build times when you're doing development, or at least uh, debugging. And so let's let's look at what that looks like. And so, for instance, here we're doing uh, we've done a uh, a build, and then we do a, a minus uh, d clean on 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 hello after building it. Uh, you'll see when you do the bit bake hello again because you've previously built it. You'll notice that in, instead of of seeing all those build steps like we talked about before, instead you will see uh, populate this root set scene, populate like set scene, and so on. In this case, these set scenes are pulling things in from the S state instead, okay? So if you're building against a shared state and you're not seeing set scenes, it means either something's changed or you've made a mistake in your metadata. Uh, for instance, in the classes that that, um, that I teach at, um, at Linux Foundation that both Tom and I teach at Linux Foundation, um, we provide an S state as a part of our lab environment. And indeed, if people don't set things up appropriately, they start downloading uh, source code um, and, and doing the build themselves. Uh, that's fine, it just takes longer. Uh, again, if you are building against a pre-built set scene, uh, a state, pardon me, you will see a series of set scenes instead to make things uh, faster. Okay, uh, let's talk recipes next. And so uh, what we're gonna do here is look at the various pieces that make up a recipe. Uh, now, uh, there are an awful lot of of uh, variables, um, and we're only going to talk about some of them. There's also an awful lot of uh, operators, and again, we're only going to talk about some of them. The best place to learn about all of these things uh, in exhaustive detail, um, if not in the source code, is in the documentation, and you will find that that all of these things are properly documented. There's just an awful lot of them. Knowing where to start sometimes is is tricky. Um, and indeed, even if you go and read the documentation, things do change over time. Uh, you know, it, it means you're always reading the documentation again. Just understand that if you need a reference, the documentation is a great place to go. Uh, but to give everybody a starting point, let's look at some of the key um, metadata variables that can be in your recipes themselves. So the first thing, of course, is where does the fetcher <laughs> find the source code? And, and we do this from the source URI. Uh, now, specifically, this is, of course, where the source code comes from. Uh, you'll notice, for, for those of you who are unaware, uh, URI is a, uh, a superset of a URL. So uh, it's a universal resource indicator as, a, as opposed to a, a universal resource locator. Now, many URIs are, in fact, URLs, but that doesn't necessarily mean they always are. And so what the source URI does is it gives you a... Uh, a pointer to where the source code or, or, or more than one source code repositories that are needed uh, come from. It also gives you uh, a place to put other things that might be uh, needed in order to build your eventual um, thing that, that's uh, provided by the recipe. Things like patch files, configuration files, and other things necessary uh, to build this particular recipe. Minimally, it provides uh, a location to get the source code from uh, in most cases. Uh, ne next, we have various dependencies. Now there's way more dependencies than just these, but the two import most important ones are depends and are depends. Uh, in the case of depends, these are in fact uh, uh, build time uh, dependencies. So these are the depends variable lists other recipes uh, that, that are needed in order to build this particular uh, recipe itself. And so these are things that need to be built before this recipe. Whereas R depends are runtime dependencies. 
And indeed, runtime dependencies are things that need to be built. They need to be on the target, but in fact, when they're built doesn't matter. Okay, so uh, in order to run whatever is built by this recipe, these other things are necessary on the target. They will be built, they will be put onto the target. Um, just that the when they're built doesn't matter. Next, we have configuration compilation options. Again, there are many of these, uh, but what you will find minimally is there are things like extra OE comp and extra OE make. Uh, now, the reason why these variables exist, uh, especially since uh, we, we have uh, tasks in order to do configures and, and builds and compiles, that is, um, we, we could just change those tasks directly, right? We could just rewrite those tasks. I said, you could do that, you could do that. The problem with that, of course, is you're changing code that that works perfectly well on its own. You just really want to add an extra option to what's there. And so there are variables that will allow you to add options to either dot slash configure in the case of extra OE comp uh, or to make itself with extra OE make. And so when make is run in, in recipes, you'll find that it actually runs a, a wrapper uh, called OE make. Uh, OE make has a, a, a variable uh, called extra OE make that allows you to ask, add extra parameters to make itself, which is very handy. And so these allow you to uh, manipulate the tasks without, without having to specifically change them just by adding extra options passed to either dot slash configure or make itself. Uh, in recipes, we can also specify what files go into which packages. We do this with the files um, variable and indeed the uh, uh, the um, uh, the name of the package goes after uh, after it in order to specify what goes into which uh, which file. So here's an example recipe. In this case, it's uh, it's an older uh, example. Uh, this is uh, actually a screenshot. Um, uh, so uh, this is an older version of, of ETH tool. But you'll see here that this gives you an example of how things fit together. Uh, and, and we'll just go through some of the examples of, of how these things fit uh, at the top here. The first thing you'll see is we have uh, the summary and uh, indeed the summary provides the, the, the one-liner version of, of what this recipe ultimately does. Uh, we also have uh, the description. This is the, the longer version of, of, uh, uh, of what this recipe does. Uh, whereas the summer, summary is, is one that's used very uh, in, in short lists of, of, of recipes, the description is quite often multiple lines and uh, quite a bit longer, uh, gets into a lot more detail. Uh, again, depending on what the tools are being used to, to look at the recipes, one or the other or both will be shown uh, in order to, uh, to allow people to know what this recipe ultimately uh, is supposed to do. Uh, next, we have uh, things like uh, the home page, maybe the bug tracker and other kinds of things that maybe the author, okay, or other things you might see here, but it tells you where the upstream source code came from. In this case, ETH tool came from kernel.org. Um, and the exact uh, web web uh, um, site that where that source code can be found. Uh, next, you'll see we have packaging metadata. Packaging metadata in this case, the section that it goes into. Um, the section really only matters when you're building packages that will be used as part of a, an upgrade process. But again, it's it's uh, it's one of those things that can be handy if provided. In this case, we're saying that it's a console network package. Uh, next, we have the license. Now, this is really important because there's a whole license collection mechanism that's a part of Yocto project. Uh, the first variable here called license will actually list the rest of uh, the, um, the, uh, the licenses that are used uh, as a part of this uh, recipe. And these refer specifically to, to known license names that are a part of uh, uh, the, the various layers that have been provided. You'll find there's a base list of recipes in in Meta, in, in OE Core, uh, that uh, provide that are they're provided that you can use here. In this case, GPLv2 plus indicates that it's uh, uh, GPLv2 or later, indeed, uh, if if necessary. And uh, in this case, you'll see that it uh, also provides a, what's called the license file checksum. In this case, it will point to the specific files that indicate that it's a GPLv2 plus. Uh, in this case, the copying file and indeed the, the top of ethtool.c, you'll find that the license is in the, the uh, comments at the top of that file. Um, and in this particular case, it is providing the uh, MD5 uh, sum of the uh, text that makes up the copying file. 
It, oh, and uh, in the case of ETHtool.c, uh, between lines 4 and 17, it provides the MD5 sum of the text that's there. In this case, the uh, lines between 4 and 17 uh, are the ones that hold the license in, in the source code itself. Uh, the idea with this is that if the, if the license ever changes, of course, the MD5 sum would change and the recipe would break. Uh, the reason why that's important is because, of course, somebody has read those two files and indicated that it's a GPL v2 plus listed at the top. This makes sure that we know that if any changes are made to the license, of course, the recipe will, of course, break and allow us to go back and see what's changed in the license appropriately. Why is it an MD5 sum? Because that was good enough at the time. Uh, and indeed, just looking for changes in the license uh, is suf it's sufficient. So whereas we don't use MD5 sums in a lot of other places anymore, we saw 256 sums, uh, certainly for licenses, MD5 sums are more than sufficient. Um, however, the next one here, the most important here uh, for this particular example is the source URI. That's really what we want to look at here more than anything else. And you'll see that it provides minimally a uh, URL as the first uh, entry there to where ETH tool lives. Now you will notice that it, there is a kernel org mirror variable that's provided at the beginning of that URL. Uh, the reason for that is because there are a number of projects uh, where source code comes from, um, the, the, the kernel, uh, kernel.org being one of them. Um, that uh, essentially, you, you'll find that that certain servers were being overwhelmed by automatic build systems uh, when it comes to certain build systems like the Octo Project Open Embedded and indeed others. Uh, and so what the problem is, is that is that if everybody, let's say, within a particular time zone builds their their um, overnight build at, let's say, 2 a.m., that's a that's a pretty common place. I imagine many of you uh, have a an overnight build uh, system. Uh, it's, it's relatively likely that it happens at 2 a.m. Uh, it might be at another time, but, but invariably you'll find that across the globe that there are a lot of things that are being built at the same time and therefore pulling source code from a particular server at a particular time. Uh, this is particularly bad when there's a lot of build servers within the same time zone and it can overwhelm a, uh, a server very quickly. Uh, this is why we have mirrors uh, for, for different source code. I don't mean uh, Yocto project source code mirrors, I mean, uh, specific websites, in fact, have their own mirror uh, servers that mirror the source code around the world. Uh, the idea with kernel org mirror is it will choose a random server from a list in order to go and download the source code from there. Uh, the idea is to try and lighten the load on the upstream servers that provide uh, those uh, that functionality. Uh, if everybody's trying to load the same, download the same source code from the same server at the same time, things get overwhelmed very quickly. Uh, and so um, a number of organizations, kernel.org being one of them, uh, uh, basically has, has requested uh, projects like the Octo Project Open Embedded uh, and, and other competing systems, in fact, to use mirror sites. And this is how it's done. Uh, you'll find that uh, there's a number of underscore mirror variables that, in fact, provide a list of mirrors for a number of different uh, upstream um, source code repositories, this being one of them. You'll also see that there is a PV variable here at the at the end, ETH tool uh, PV. Now, in this particular case, uh, we haven't talked about PV yet. This is actually will be the uh, the package version, uh, but you'll find that the package version, if provided as a part of the file name, uh, will be extracted and will automatically be added here again. Uh, we want to rep uh, not repeat ourselves as much as we possibly can. If we provide metadata in one place, it's nice to use it elsewhere. In this case, that's what we're doing. Otherwise, you'll see that we have a uh, we've we've escaped the the end of line character and put things on multiple lines here. All of these URIs uh, uh, point to local files within the recipe itself, and you'll see that we have a number of patch files here and uh, run ptest file for for testing on the target and so on. Um, but these these patch files will be automatically added on top of ETH tool during the, the patch step as a uh, patch, patch task rather uh, as a result. Now, oh yes, um, yeah. And when it comes to uh, mirrors, 
uh, ultimately it, it's defined in meta. You'll find that all, I think all of the mirror variables uh, that, that are used in meta are a part of meta itself. And indeed, um, Michael's pointing to where uh, the kernel or kernel or mirror is specified. There's also ones for um, the Free Software Foundation and a few others as well, and very likely uh, in the same place. Uh, the next thing is in this particular case, we are downloading a tar file. Okay, the source URI specifies a tar file. We want to make sure that what we get down is the same tar file that was used by the original packager. Uh, that's really important for a couple of reasons. First of all, we want to make sure that the the uh, steps that we provided as a part of this recipe, uh, of course, have only been tested against a particular version. Uh, and of course, uh, if that source code has changed in any way, of course, the steps may no longer be valid. Uh, and so when the tar file is downloaded, it is matched against, uh, these days we only do SHA-256 sums. We actually don't do MD5 sums. In fact, I should remove that. Um, but uh, SHA-256 sum is run on the tarball and indeed it is matched against uh, the one that's provided here in the recipe. If it has changed, of course, we will get an error. And again, this makes sure that the upstream tarball hasn't been changed. It makes sure that the uh, in, in the process of downloading, it hasn't been modified, okay? Uh, perhaps uh, via some sort of uh, intervening cache or maybe an attacker of some sort. Uh, it also means that um, uh, since the, um, since this recipe was written, it also makes sure that the tarball that was downloaded was not changed by either the upstream author or in fact by an attacker as well. So we know for a fact cryptographically that in fact the source code that we've downloaded was the same uh, as the source code that was read by the original recipe author. And so that's really important uh, that, uh, that we check the, the integrity of, of what we've downloaded for those three reasons. Um, here we're also inheriting some BB classes and we're making some changes to the runtime dependencies in this particular case as well. Thanks, Michael, for pointing out the, uh, the location of those. Uh, yes, so the shot sum is valid, uh, is valid for uh the particular PV. You will find that in this particular case, although uh, oh it's actually listed up here. This is for ETH tool. Uh, 3.15, your PV in this case is 3.15. Uh, the idea is if the version of, of uh, the source upstream source code changed, you would change the name of the file. You would also update the SHA-256 sum. So yes, the, the whole point is that it, it is uh, valid only for the version that, that the recipe is intended for. Yeah, so the, the whole point would, would be, and again, there's different ways of doing this, but the whole point is, is that you would make another recipe, you would change the recipe for the name of the file and, and, and then SHA-256 sum at the same time. So um, what, what, what can a recipe do? Again, it's all the things needed to go from, um, from, from upstream source to a binary package and ultimately to an image. And so the kinds of things that you need are the, the various host tools required, the compiler, the utilities, uh, any other kinds of, of builds, utilities that you might need, uh, linkers and whatnot, um, maybe you're using LTO or something else. Uh, in the case of, um, uh, of building a system, you also need things like bootloaders, kernels, drivers, uh, and so on. Uh, on your, your uh, image, you, you're also gonna need things like the supporting libraries, interpreters, uh, the various plugins and uh, extensions that, that are needed to make it all work. And then ultimately uh, any user space applications and all those kinds of things. All, and then of course the image itself uh, along with package groups and whatnot. Every one of those things is provided by uh, at least one recipe uh, that, that can then be depended on by other recipes to make sure that things work uh, appropriately. Oh, going back, uh, there's a uh, question here. Whoops, question here talking about source URIs. Uh, in this particular case, you'll find we say source URI, and then this is actually an attribute here, it's called. Um, in this case, SHA-256 sum uh, talks about a, a SHA-256 sum, but doesn't really say what it is for specifically. You'll find that if specified like this, it, it's, best, it's uh, based on the first thing in the, in the source URI list. So uh, this SHA-256 sum is, uh, is uh, um, inherently 
uh, referring to the tar file at the beginning here, uh, you will find that there are ways of specifying specific things in the source URI list, but by default, it's the first thing in the list, which by convention is the tarball uh, that uh, that you're you're trying to protect uh, in this particular case. So uh, again, exactly what the, the attribute uh, is used here for uh, is, is somewhat dependent. In this particular case, there's a, a loose coupling. There's an understanding that this refers to the the tarball, which is the first thing in the list, uh, but you'll find that we can explicitly specify what we what we're talking about um, if if there's more than one one SHA two fifty six sum that we need to provide. Um, but you know, uh, as programmers, we're lazy. We want to type as little as possible. This is a nice, convenient way of doing it. Is what it comes down to. Make sense. So uh, let's look at recipe operators next. Now, I'm pretty sure everyone here uh, has probably used uh, operators before. I'm sure everybody thinks, oh, they're easy, uh, you know, no problems. So we don't need to go through them. Uh, skip on. Uh, the reality is, is there's a bunch of, of uh, gotchas in here. And uh, what you'll find is that unless you've gone through and uh, read the uh, part of the documentation that gets into all these things, there are some pitfalls. Uh, and uh, it's not always obvious why you would want to use different different operators uh, in different situations. Um, the people that that work with with metadata all the time, uh, of course, many people know this stuff in their sleep. Uh, but the problem is, is that in, when you first come along, it's not always obvious how these things fit together. So I always find it's really helpful to go through uh, recipe operators uh, that work with the variables so people understand the, the uh, some of the corner cases and how they work. So the first thing is, is, of course, just a regular assignment. A equals something in this case at the top there. So A equals foo. The thing to remember is that when you're doing an assignment in BitBake, uh, it's like assignments in, in a make file. It's a late assignment. So until uh, you actually dereference A, uh, this is a promise to add uh, to assign foo to A. This is not an actual assignment. This is what's called a late assignment. And so, and again, until we do reference A, this assignment actually doesn't happen. Um, now, what this means is, is that if we assign uh, something to A more than once, uh, it will be the most recent assignment that is used prior to A being dereferenced. Okay, and so what this means, if we say A equals foo and then A equals bar, and then we do reference A, of course, A is going to be bar, uh, is what it comes down to. But um, uh, but it, 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 it's, it's when A is dereferenced that, that indicates what value is ultimately used. And so if you try to read a series of assignments sequentially, uh, it doesn't work that way, okay? It's whatever value was assigned to A at the time it was dereferenced that, that ultimately is, is used as a result. Um, and so uh, reading through assignments in a purely linear way doesn't work. You have to think more like the way it works in a make file. Next thing we have is something called a default value. And so in this case, we're saying B uh, has a default value of, of zero T. Uh, what this means is, is B does not yet have a value or hasn't yet had uh, a late assignment associated with it. Uh, this provides uh, a value. And so uh, this is basically saying, does B have a value? If not, this is the value I want it set to. This can be very useful in situations where you want to make sure there is a value, but only if there wasn't already a value assigned. However, there's also a, and again, this is like a make file, the way it works in make. Uh, however, the next one is called a late default assign a value. And so this is this is unique to BitBake. This is a double question mark equals. Um, the thing with B, uh, the, the one above it, the late, the, the default value is the question being that, that's uh, being asked is, is there already a value assigned? Uh, and if not, assign this. In the case of C, uh, the, the C example here, the late default, uh, however, uh, it's it's doing a similar thing. Um, however, in the case of a late default, it's not the first assignment as a default that's taken, it's the last. So in the case of uh, B question mark equals, if you have more than one of those, it's the first that, that is uh, taken into account because thereafter B has a value. In the case of a late default, um, it changes and it's the last default that's that's added. It makes it work more like a like a late assignment. 
Okay. Um, now, in the case of a late default, it is overridden by a default, which is overridden by an assignment. So just understand that there is a hierarchy when it comes to setting values. And indeed, if you set a value in, um, for instance, a uh, configuration file or in a BB class or whatnot, you might want to set a default value, one that can then be later overridden by somebody else. And indeed, there's multiple levels of default as a result. Just understand it's the first default and the last late default that is ultimately taken uh, if, if not, nothing else is provided. Uh, we also have something called an immediate assignment. And again, this is just like make files. Uh, this works the way you'd expect and equal to work in Python normally. Uh, it means that the, the value that is assigned is assigned now and, 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 and not uh, as a promise later. It also means that if this refers to any other variable, those variables are dereferenced at this point. Uh, and so where do you use uh, immediate assignments versus uh, late assignments? Uh, depends on how you want to make things work. But normally we use late assignments for everything, unless there's a very specific reason that we want to make sure that the value is read now or dereferenced now. So you'll see them used in places. Normally you don't, though, unless you've got a very specific need. Uh, now we also have, um, you'll find that there's a series of uh, append and prepend options uh, in the case of uh, the first one, uh, the, the dot equals, uh, this is very much like how um, Perl does uh, does uh, uh, appends and prepends, but you'll see that, or appends rather, um, with dot equals. But we also have an equals dot, okay, which allows us to do a prepend. What that means is based on the variables that we have set above us there, we do an a dot equals bar, you'll see that we end up with foobar. If we do a, um, a B equals dot uh, W0, of course we get a woot, right? Because it's an OT up here. And um, uh, plus equals and equals plus, plus equals is like in, in uh, make files. Uh, it allows you to append with uh, with a uh, implicit space being added. This means that in the case of C being set to ABC, uh, if we do a plus equals DEF, of course we get a space DEF. Uh, and of course we've got this weird uh, other operator yeah, equals plus that allows us to do a, a prepend, which is super handy. Again, all of these are great. Um, you'll see that we, in this case, we have UVW, which prepended to X, Y, Z. There's a, uh, a space in between as a result here. All right, so if you don't want spaces, you use the dot versions. If you want spaces, you add a plus, you use the plus versions of the uh, append and prepend operators. Uh, now, that said, there are other, uh, there's even more ways of doing this. And for this, we also have the ability to uh, to add, to use uh, colon append and colon prepend. Um, now, the reason for this is simple. Th these are uh, effectively operators, but these happen after all the other operators have been used. And so you'll find that we go through all the equals, uh, everything on the previous page, those happen first. At the very end, we then have these other oper uh, uh, operations that happen. So. Uh, a colon append works just like the, the dot equals otherwise. In this case, if a equals foo, and we do a, a colon append bar, uh, we get foo bar. Uh, again, with prepend, it works exactly the same way based on, on these values. However, we also have the remove operator. This allows us to do an a colon remove of, in this case, uh, OOB. This, of course, would change foo bar into far. And uh, in this case, b colon remove uh, you know, zero, zero would change woot into just WT. Um, and so again, you will find that these actually happen in order. Um, and uh, you can you can read them um, as if they happen immediately, but again, they happen after all other operators. And so the, the order in which things happen, of course, you have to keep in mind, but ultimately these will uh, will fire appropriately, otherwise in order that you you specify them. The order matters because it depends where you put them. If you put them in a, a .bb append file, it happens after the existing recipe. Uh, if you add them as a part of a BB class, for instance, if you're in a BB class, uh, there will be things that run before and after uh, it is inherited within your recipe. So the order matters and exactly which operator you use matters uh, due, due to that order. Uh, to make things even more exciting, we have the, the override operators. And so what this allows us to do is to have a variable called overrides. It gives you a colon separated list uh, of variables that can be added or not variables. Uh, basically things that can be added with the colon in order to 
uh, do optional things when we're doing assignments. So let's say we start with uh, A equals ABC, and then we do an AOS equals. In this particular case, what you'll see is that there is an override called OS here at the beginning. And as a result, uh, this would, at least in isolation, would, would associate, um, instead of doing an, uh, an A equals ABC, because OS is defined, it would instead assign A uh, all in caps, ABC it would override this. Okay, uh, so instead of in lowercase, it would it would do an uppercase uh, assigned instead. Okay, so it would override this complete because of this override. However, you'll see we also have an A append arch. What and, and because arch is an override that's here, you will see that in fact we will take whatever value of A that we have. In this case, it's A B C, and it will in fact append uh, D E F. Now, in this case, of course, there's no space. Uh, but it will append that because arch is also specified as an override. And then last, you'll see that we have an A prepend OS. And again, what this will do is because OS is provided as an override, it will prepend uh, uh, X, Y, Z all in caps. Um, and so in this particular case, the bottom three will fire, the top one will not because all of these overrides are provided. And again, we've got appends, prepends, and an assignment. If these were assignments, of course, uh, you would have to deal with precedence. How do we know which one comes uh, after the other? Um, we always go from right to left, and it's the last one uh, that we get to. So basically, the uh, we we consider the first one on the left, but it is the last one that, that we get to that ultimately uh, wins is what it works. So the, the higher, uh, later in the list has a higher precedence is what I'm trying to say. Uh, remove, if I remember correctly, remove, so I, I rarely use remove, I rarely need to, if I remember correctly, it only removes the first one. Uh, oh, it, it is all occurrences? Okay, I, 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 uh, I don't often need to do more than one occurrence. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, there you go. Michael would know. Uh, honestly, we, we didn't have remove for a long time, so I just never use it. Uh, I thought there was a, a way of doing one or, or all, and I can't remember which, uh, anyway. Remove is, is uh, despite being around for a while since Dunfell, it's, it's still something I don't use very often. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, and remove is always called last. Yes. That would make sense. Um, the next thing is unsetting variables. Again, this was something that that uh, uh, that we couldn't do for many, many years, but we have for the last couple, and that's the, the, uh, the ability to effectively delete a variable. Uh, this is very handy because certainly in the past, um, remember I said you can change just about anything. Uh, the, the best we could do it for, for a long time was just assign a, a negative or um, an empty value uh, to variables. The idea essentially is, is, again, with things like remove and unset, we can actually undo things that have been un done earlier uh, in a recipe, and so in fact, you can you can literally do anything with these variables, both overriding, uh, uh, overwriting, or indeed unsetting uh, variables. Uh, and this actually allows you to, of course, unset a variable or indeed a, a task attribute or other things like that. We also have a series of of other. Um, uh, meta, uh, variables that can be used. Now we actually have them from, from different. Uh, different layers, you'll see at the very top uh, of our build sequence, we actually have uh, what's called top dir, uh, layer dir and file. Th these three are defined uh, by default by BitBake in all, all situations. Although you could override these, you should not. And that's because top dir always refers to the place um, that you, from which you run BitBake, which is the, 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 the top level build directory. It's the uh, it's the relative starting point of the rest of your um, of your metadata and that sort of thing. Uh, not metadata, the, rather uh, you, your build system, you, the rest of your build directories and so on. Rather, uh, layer dir gives you the directory of the layer you're currently in. And now that um, you'll find that in a lot of examples, that's within your build directory. It's more common to put your layers elsewhere. So indeed, this will give you the, the absolute path to wherever the, the top level of the, the layer you're in uh, lives. Uh, file will give you the full path and name of the file that you're currently in. So when you refer to file, um, it will, um, it will 
expand to the name of, of the file name that you're in and of course the full path to get to it. Uh, you'll find that many other things are dependent on these variables being set appropriately and you'll see reference to these three variables throughout the rest of the uh, of many of the variables that are set by Bitbank. Uh, we also have a series of policy variables. Uh, these are these are things that are set by uh, the BSP or indeed by uh, by other things. Uh, but you'll see things like the build arch and the target arch. The build arch is the of course the host machine architecture, um, and that's because this is where we're doing the building of of the source code. Uh, the target, of course, is the thing for which you are building, and of course those architectures may be. But, uh, it means that we are building on one architecture for another, cross compiling for another. Uh, lots of other policy variables as well. And also find we have a number of build time uh, variables. Now these are, are set um, either automatically by BitBake for a particular recipe or as a consequence of the recipe. Uh, and so you'll find that these things are pulled in or derived by the recipe itself uh, by BitBake. Uh, the first one is PN, which refers to the package name. Uh, it is the portion of the recipe file name that is not the, the version or the the uh, uh, the release, uh, you will find that when it comes to the names of uh, recipe files, you'll find in the examples that we showed you before, just going back a few slides here, uh, you'll see that we have if tool underscore 3.15. And when it comes to the name of BB files, underscores are used for separating uh, version and revision you will find that when you refer to version revision in dependencies, you use dashes instead. This is one of those uh, uh, things that you have to be uh, very familiar with. The, the, the name of the, in the name of a file, it has to be an underscore everywhere else we use dashes. Okay, and that can get confusing at times, uh, but make sure that uh, again, only file names have underscores in all other situations, the separator is a dash. Okay, and so we have PN for package name, we have PV for package uh, version, and this is the version of the source code. Uh, and then we have PR, which is the package release. And again, this is the, the, the release, uh, uh, or the revision rather of the metadata itself, of the recipe itself. Okay, so if you've made changes, in theory, you should be updating the PR, uh, pardon me, the, the, uh, the R number, the, the PR value itself. And again, you can do that in the name of the file, or you can just specify PR equals within the recipe itself. We have two aggregate um, uh, P variables as well. We have P itself, which is PN-PV, and we have PF, which is PN-PV-PR. You will see that these get used in other variables quite a lot in order to uh, have package and version and package version and revision uh, in other uh, used in other variables. The file dir name is next here, and you'll see that uh, the directory uh, this 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 uh, basically does a dir name of file, so we just get the path of as to where uh, file lives. Uh, we also have, have files path, and what files path does is it allows when we do things like includes for us to look for a particular path um, with with uh, within the the recipe itself. You'll see that typically this starts with file dir name and it looks in PF, it looks in P, PN uh, files, and then dir name itself. This works for uh, file URIs, but also looks for, uh, works rather for includes and requires and that sort of thing. And so you'll see that in fact, we can provide optional files um, to be used with a particular recipe based on uh, the, the version, the revision, the name of the recipe that we're a part of. Now we also have uh, build time dependency uh, metadata. And so I, again, we've got that top dir that's provided by BitBake. It's, it's where we run BitBake at the, at, at, the, at the very top of our build. Uh, you'll, see, you'll find we have what's called tempter, uh, TMP, not to be confused with TEMP, which is something else. Um, uh, this is top dir temp. This is where all of our, our build artifacts end up. Uh, everything under slash uh, under uh, top dir temp, in fact, is temporary. In fact, you can delete the temp directory and recreate it completely. There's work dir. Uh, this is where we, we do all of our uh, work per recipe. And uh, it's temp dir work. And, and then, in fact, there's a few other things in there. We've just simplified it down to PF. Uh, but basically, uh, there's a machine type in there, in fact, as well, that that I should really add. But, but basically, this is where we're we're building our source code for a specific recipe. 
then we have the S uh, directory. This is the source uh, directory, and this is under workdir P. Notice that uh, P, of course, is, is your name and version. Um, we have our B direct uh, B variable. This is our build directory. Now, by default, this points to S, but if you want to build out of tree, in other words, if you don't want to build as a part of your source code for various reasons, you can move it elsewhere, but you'll see that otherwise it builds in the source code tree by default otherwise. Uh, we also have uh, D, which is our destination directory, which is our work or image. This is the, uh, the place where we do a, a, an install prior to packaging to make that work appropriately. This is not, the image that goes onto your eventual target. This is just the uh, the output of the install uh, step that happens otherwise. Next, we have the deploy uh, deploy directory. Uh, this is where the the output of the build happens. And so, under temp or deploy, this is where we'll find our package feed, our licenses, and in fact, our images themselves. Uh, deploy dir image, of course, is the next uh, variable uh, here. And indeed, that's under the deploy images directory. This is where the the output kernel device tree and other kinds of things uh, ultimately uh, end up. Uh, next, we have build time, um, build uh, dependency metadata. And so we have things like depends and provides. Uh, build time de dependencies, of course, are first with, with uh, depends. Uh, we can also provide uh, names for ourselves. By default, this, this uh, is defined as P, PF, and PN. And so uh, that means that other people can depend on us by our package name, our package name and version, our package name, version, and revision. And so uh, we can actually give ourselves other names as well in there. Uh, so we can actually add to our provides names um, uh, so we not only provide dependencies, but also what other uh, recipes can refer to us by. Uh, you'll see that we also have various runtime package dependency versions here, our depends, our recommends, our suggests, and so on. In the case of our depends, these are dependencies that we need on our target at runtime, uh, whereas our recommends, these are packages that are optionally um, uh, dependencies, basically. If they're available, they go onto the target. If not, they don't. Uh, but depends, recommends, and suggests, these are ideas that come from the Debian packaging system. In the case of suggest, these are these are not actually packages that are strictly necessary on it, even if, if required, uh, but as a part of the, uh, the, the, the uh, Debian package being built, they would be listed as suggests within that package itself. Um, we also have our provides. This will, of course, allow us to name ourselves as um, uh, that we provide a, a particular uh, named package or version package uh, such that others can refer to us as a runtime dependency by this R provides. So analogous to provides in the, in the previous list. We also have R conflicts, which basically allows us to conflict with specific runtime packages, as well as R replaces, which uh, if you both conflict and replace a particular package, it means you will be used over the other one, because of course only one of them can be used at a time. And again, these are ideas that come from the, um, from packaging uh, managers and how they fit together. Um, next, you'll see we have uh, variables that you, you commonly set, but don't strictly have to. This is what's called common metadata quite often. Uh, so we have our summary, which again is a short description of the package. We've got the home page, which are upstream uh, source code uh, web page. We've got our license, and this could be a, a list of licenses, or in some cases, quite a complex uh, set. Often, there's only one license, but there could be more than one. In some cases, there could be dual licenses and others. There's a, a mechanism for specifying one or more licenses. And indeed, um, if something is dual license, there's a way of indicating that as well. Uh, however, these all uh, need to be backed up by um, lick files uh, or license file checksums, this points to specific files or portions of those files uh, with MD5 sums so that we know that the recipes that are in the, the license, sorry, the, the licenses that are in the license list are specified uh, at those locations in those files, um, such that if those ever change, of course, the MD5 sum will, will fail and we can go back and look at them. Uh, the source URI, of course, specifies where the source code patches, configuration files and other things that are necessary in order to build this particular recipe. The fetcher will go get them uh, if they're elsewhere. Uh, quite often, 
there's one or more things that comes from a uh, uh, elsewhere from a source code management system or whatever, everything else generally is local, things like patch files and uh, configuration things and whatnot. These are provided by the recipe itself. Uh, and then finally, we've got files. And again, this is not to be confused with file without the S, which refers to the specific file we're in. In the case of files, uh, these are the files that go into a particular package name. Um, the uh, the number of variables that are similarly named and somewhat confusing, um, unfortunately, are many. And uh, you can go and complain to some of the other people that are at the conference as to why that is later on. But this is one of those situations. File and file uh, have very different meanings and don't uh, confuse the two. Uh, let's look at a couple of recipes so we can see some examples here. In this particular case, again, we're going to look at uh, a slightly older version of BC, in this case, 1.06. In this case, you'll see that it uses uh, license files checksum and source URI. Uh, you'll see here we have our, our summary, our home page. Here we have our license information. And so you'll see it saying it's GPLv2 and uh, GPLv2. Uh, uh, LGPL, pardon me, version 2.1. And again, it will point to the various files, in this case, uh, for the binaries being built, for the library that's being built. And then again, in a couple of the header files and, and C files where you can find those licenses listed appropriately. Now, in some cases, you will have licenses in lots or in some cases, every single file. Uh, choose the, um, choose, choose, uh, examples of that license in core files so typically that's a, a central header file uh, or the c file that has the main uh the main routine in it or whatever uh, so choose sort of central places where if the license changes, it'll be very obvious that that uh, uh that changes has occurred here we have section and depend uh, this is a part of the the packaging metadata so it's saying it's in the base section uh, here we have our build time metadata, which is our, our depends. Uh, our source URI that indicates where our source code comes from, there's the GNU mirror, okay, uh, to get the source code. Again, the, the, the PV comes from comes from the name, although we didn't include it up here, that the PV would come from the name uh, normally. Um, here you'll see that we have a file. In this case, it's a patch file. This would be automatically patched. Uh, on top of the uh, source code once it was unpacked. Again, there's a SHA-256 sum. Uh, we, prior to this, we also supported MD5 sum as well, although I believe that's now been, uh, well, it's been deprecated for a while. I think it's been removed now. Uh, but basically, uh, this tar file will have a SHA-256 sum associated with it and uh, checked. Uh, here we're inheriting uh, class files, BB class files. And so in this case, auto tools, tech info, update alternatives. What this means is that all the tasks required for building this, because it's a, an auto tools thing, will come from that auto tools BB class file such that uh, it will know to do a configure, make, you know, make install kind of kind of steps. You'll notice we don't have to provide any tasks. Those are all provided by the auto tools uh, BB class to make that work properly, uh, as, as well as any documentation that's being built. In this case, is being built with tech info and so on. Uh, now, because we also have update alternatives, there's some some variables that are set for that, such that uh, uh, BC and DC can actually live on the same system and provide alternatives for each other. Uh, but you'll see otherwise, there's a thing at the end here called BB class extend. This provides a uh, the ability to, in fact, build not only a target version of this utility, but also a native package. So you can see that we're actually saying BB class extend. This would actually build, uh, allow for uh, a BC-native version of this package to be specified as a dependency, such that a uh, a host-native version of the package would be built, not a cross version, but a host-native version that might be needed uh, for the build of, of uh, another package or whatnot. So BB class extend allows us to have the same recipe work for both cross and for native builds. Yeah, the, the slide title up here uh, should have the version number in it. Um, I'm, I'm just realizing there's a couple of updates I need to make that I missed from last time. But yeah, there should be a, a number here that was removed for whatever reason. 
So let's let's build upon uh, a BB class here. The, the whole idea here is, is using inheritance again to try and have a, a dry design, a, a don't repeat yourself uh, kind of, of design. And again, the BB class ultimately will be used for uh, for doing that, for taking those common steps and putting them into a, a central place that we can inherit from. Uh, and so in this case, we're going to use auto tools to make that work appropriately. And um, and what happens here essentially is, is that uh, when you do an inherit, it will look in the classes directories in each one of the layers looking for an appropriate file to make that happen. And uh, and then and then the inherit will effectively cut and paste the code from that file at the location that you specify. Uh, you'll notice that we, when we do inherits, it's in the middle of the recipe. There is a canonical order that we put things into recipes. Inherits end up in the middle uh, of that canonical order. And although we haven't gone through the, the explicit order, in fact, I have uh, uh, effectively listed those names as, I've, as we've gone through those, those recipes, those example recipes in, in the previous examples. So uh, let's let's look at another example here. Uh, so there was a question just a second ago here that says, why is it at the end? It's, it's actually not at the end, it's in the middle. So there's things that before it, there's things that went after. And so it's, it's uh, uh, we have our descriptive metadata, our license metadata, our packaging metadata, our build metadata is here. We then have our inherits, inherits our overrides, um, our runtime metadata uh, uh, missing, something and then we have our uh, extensions at the end. So uh, inherits are actually in the middle. It's just that there's a number of things here that we, we haven't specified after it is all. Make sense? So there's, there's things that, that, that conventionally go before it, there's things that conventionally go after it. So if you uh, just add things randomly in a recipe, uh, that's not the right way of doing it. There, there is in fact a canonical order and again, uh, it is listed in the documentation as the order that things should be provided uh, in a recipe. Uh, to be fair, not every recipe in Meta follows that to a T. Uh, it depends on exactly what you're trying to do, but uh, in general, there is an order that's that's supposed to be followed when putting together a recipe. Uh, so uh, specifying a source URI in a BB uh, class uh, would only be done with with a with a default value. You'd never put source URI equals in here. You but you might do a, a question mark equals. So yes, you could do that by convention. You would not. But like I said, if you wanted to provide a source URI in um, in a BB class, you could do so with either a default or a late default. But it it would be very uncommon to do that. There, there there aren't many examples where that would make sense. Many use cases, but you could provide uh, a default source URI if you wanted to. But the idea is to provide it ahead of time such that it is not set in the BB class. Because again, it doesn't really make sense to do that. You're not stopped from doing uh, poor poor behavior is not something that is precluded. Uh, again, you can do anything, but. Uh, Following the conventional way means that you're, well, what I always tell people is that when you're coding or for that matter, writing a recipe, you're having a conversation with yourself and others in the future. And you always want to be in a situation where you remember what you did. And the easiest way to do that is to follow convention such that when you look back at it, you can understand it again. If you do something that's weird or odd, you're going to look at it later and go, who was the idiot who wrote this? And unfortunately, it was you. So make sure that you do things in as conventional a way as possible. If you stray from convention, document it, because uh, you, you will in, invariably be asking why this was done in the future, despite you being the person who wrote it. And you don't want anybody else to question that either. If, if you had to do something weird, uh, make sure you justify why in the recipe, because otherwise somebody's going to come and ask you why you did that weird thing. Make sense? Much of the conventions written in the documentation, um, much of it is not. Much of this you just have to learn. Uh, but again, we have some of the best documentation in the industry when it comes to open source. Uh, it is not, as 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 Michael reiterated, uh, and and I, I said before, it is not complete. 
uh, but it is it is uh, about as complete as as uh, as any other uh, example of documentation. But uh, absolutely everything is not in it. All right, uh, so let's look at another example here. And again, we're looking specifically at the the inherits in this case, both auto tools and get text. Uh, you'll see that we also uh, customize things by specifying an extra OEconf uh, and other things like that, also files. So in Flack, and again, you'll see we have our descriptive metadata here at the top, saying what it is, where we got it from, where the bug tracker is. Uh, here's some packaging metadata, metadata saying which section it's in. Here's the licensing metadata, which is quite, quite long. Uh, here we have our, our build dependencies, right? Our, our build uh, source code and, and uh, where the source code comes from, the source URI and so on. Um, here we actually also specify the name of uh, the package uh, upstream as a part of the CVE database. And so there is a, um, there is a, a, um, a BB class that you can use as part of your build configuration that uh, will automatically look up during the build process will automatically look up to see whether it's a CVE for the, the package that you're building. In this case, uh, the name of the recipe and the name used by the CVE database is different. And so the name, the CVE product name is, is listed here as libflack. Otherwise it uses the name of the, it uses PN by default otherwise. Uh, here it does the inherit. And again, you'll see it's in the middle. Uh, immediately after that, we have what are called overrides. In this case, you'll see that we are setting uh, extra OEConf we're also um, adding to uh, OEComp based on uh, some executable metadata here. So there's some, some Python code that runs and then uh, sets uh, variables or rather uh, options dependent on whether or not, uh, in this case, Altebec Core 2 or Core i7 exists in the tune features variable. So these are, these are um, uh, variable uh, appends essentially that happen to the extra OE comp variable. Down here, we list a series of packages beyond the normal packages that are provided by uh, by BitBake, and so specifically named packages. And then we add things specifically to those packages based on these files variables down here uh, to make that work appropriately. Notice we can use things like uh, 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 wildcards and globbing and so on to make this all work appropriately. Uh, let's see here. Uh, no need to escape embedded double quotes inside of extra OEConf. Oh, inside here? Uh, these are inside curly braces. And so um, th this is its own environment. Anything in dollar curly braces, this, this is its own environment past the Python. Uh, so these, these, do, these are not a part of the external string. This external string will take whatever the uh, expanded version of the Python code is. And we know it's Python code because it's dollar open curly brace at. So uh, this is executable code inside. Why don't we put the lib in R depends? Why don't we put the lib in R depends? Uh, which, which library are you referring to? Libflack? Libflack is built by this, by this uh, recipe. So it, it 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 would be it would end up being a runtime dependency of itself, which doesn't make sense. So only somebody else would do that. You don't do that to yourself. Um, the first extra OE comp does not have a dollar. This one here, yeah, and that's because there isn't double quotes in it. You'll notice that there there isn't. Uh, oh, here I see. You're saying here, right here. Um, yeah, I don't actually, I think that's a, that's an, I think that's an actually an error. I, that would actually work anyways. Uh, but, um, yeah, that, that's, uh, in this particular case, um, in this particular case, that is weird. I'd have to look at that. It's, it's, I see what you're saying with these ones right here. Uh, I don't, uh, yeah, I'd have to actually look at that. I don't think, I don't think double quotes there actually makes sense. I think single quotes would make more sense, but anyway. Um, can you clarify the environment that Flax configure will see during execution? Is there a sysroot with only, um, can I clarify? It will be whatever is built by, uh, whatever is unpacked and made by the patch system ahead of time and whatever, whatever variables are set as a part of BitBake and in the recipe itself. In order to see exactly what that environment is, you'd have to, you'd have to, uh, you'd have to go in and look, okay? 
And uh, there's a few ways of doing that. You can look at your environment using bitbake minus E. Uh, you can also use something called um, DevShell uh, to go in and see what the environment is at that time. Uh, but uh, you will find that, that you can make assumptions that basically nothing is set other than the same things that, that are provided by BitBake itself. But uh, if you need to go and see what those things are, you can go see them uh, in a number of different ways. We haven't looked at that specifically yet here. That, that's a much more complicated question to answer at this particular point in time, given we only have a few minutes left. Uh, however, the last question is, uh, is uh, would that environment depend on, on BitBake executing the process in parallel? And the answer is no. Uh, everything built in parallel is in its own environment. And so uh, there are no dependencies between tasks because everybody has uh, a per recipe uh, sysroot. So there, there are no dependencies between build steps unless explicitly sp stated in which case things are copied in the local uh, build environment. So. It's nice and it's not nice. It's it's nice because you don't have to worry about it. It's not nice because it takes a lot of disk space, uh, but it's it's highly reproducible, which of course is what we want. Um, yeah, let's get through a few more here, and then we're going to have to pass the rest off to uh, to Tom to do in the the rest of the uh, the talk here. Next thing is, is grouping local metadata. And so again, if you do are doing common things all the time and it doesn't make sense to put it into, into a BB class, uh, at this point, instead, you can put it into an ink file. And again, we can either use an include or require. If, however, uh, the, the, the common values are uh, only sometimes used, by using an include again, it will not include the file unless it finds it. In the case of a, a series of recipes that always have the same, you know, series of, of steps in it, uh, but it doesn't make sense to put it into a BB class. Instead, you can put it to an ink file and require it. And again, if it cannot find that ink file, it will fail at that point and you'll get an error. So again, the difference between include and require is whether or not uh, it's an error if it doesn't find the file or not. And again, there's, there are use cases for both situations. Let's look at another example here, in this case, Ophono. And uh, so again, this uh, this exists in Pocky Meta, uh, Recipes Connectivity. Um, you'll see in here we have package configuration and distro features. Uh, and again, we have an append, a do install append, which allows us to change uh, a portion of, the, um, of a task by merely changing what's there already. We can actually append steps to an existing task, which is actually really awesome. So here, again, you'll see that we actually uh, start by requiring ophono.inc. And this is because there's several different recipes that all start the same way. And so all of those common things are put into ophono.inc. And then we, in fact, override the things at the end. Now, this is one of those situations where the canonical order it gets a bit weird because, of course, ophono inc, which is on the next page, has things in the canonical order, but then we override those things by requiring that file first and then changing them afterwards. This is one of those situations where that, that order has been changed in order to allow us to use uh, that include file. And so you'll see that uh, whatever is set up here, we, we then change these specific things, whether or not they're set in here, these are the values that are now used. So this is the source URI, you'll see that we have our source code there. Um, specified based on BPN and BP. These are set in the include file. Uh, there's a local file called Ophono that's referenced. Here we have the source URI, MB5 sum and, and chop 56 sum that specified the tar file. And then here we are doing a conditional append on C flags, but only if we're using UC libc. UC libc actually is no longer supported by Yakko project. Again, this is an older uh, an older uh, example. However, you can see how based on something like an override, how you can append uh, to something like C flags based on which library you're using. And so you can see that in this case, it's adding uh, the GNU source code, um, as a GNU source rather uh, variable in order to make sure that the uh, GNU version of the source code is used, um, API rather is used. Here's the include file. And so you'll see that in this, is, this looks more like a, a regular thing and you'll just notice we don't have any um, build uh, dependency or uh, build metadata in here. Again, we have our descriptive metadata at the top. We have our license metadata. We go straight into inherits and that's because we're going to include this file into somewhere else and we're going to specify this later. Uh, here we have our dependencies. 
Strictly speaking, this should have been before the inherits, but anyway, there you go. Uh, here we have some uh, some variables that are used by the initialization system. You'll see that we uh, we do a, an inherit of update dot, uh, dash rcd. These are variables used by that BB class for installing it into the appropriate portion of the initialization system. Uh, we have some package configuration again with some some uh, executable metadata in there. Again, there's some Python code that will be run. Uh, some package config other compact package configuration stuff as well. Oops. Um, here we specify uh, extra OEComp uh, setup variables for uh, system D. Uh, here we're making a, a change. We're appending some code to the do install task that's provided by uh, uh, the inheritance. Um, and then uh, you'll find down here that we, again, we make some changes to, to runtime dependencies and packaging. And again, this is all roughly in the appropriate order. Again, it is included into the file we showed you before and extra information changed at the, uh, at the end. Uh, okay, so uh, in fact, we've run out of time. So uh, I'm gonna suggest that we stop there. Um, uh, and uh, what you'll find is that um, Tom will, will pick up, normally he, he starts here, he's just gonna start one a uh, bit back, but when we come back uh, at the uh, beginning of the next chapter is when we will get on to when things go wrong, and uh, we'll go on from there. Tom, I see, I see you're here already. So uh, there you go. It's starting on, on page fifty-four, and uh, we had a bunch of questions that uh, meant that I didn't get quite as far as I often do. So. Other than that, uh, if, there, if there are any other questions, now's a good time to ask them, but otherwise we are into the mid, uh, midday break. Uh, looking at the, um, looking at the uh, thing here, we have a, a one, roughly one hour break. We'll come back in at half past the next hour and we'll pick up from there. So I guess, what, 57 minutes from now. Uh, we'll pick up the next section and we'll get into how those things work. Uh, let's see here. Is package config system be similar to Gen 2's use flags? Uh, use flags are quite different ideas. Uh, in this particular case, what's going on is it's it's uh, you're referring to this part here. Uh, basically, what's happening is uh, when it comes to packaging, uh, the packaging mechanism, uh, in this case, it's saying in, in the case of system D being used, th this is going to be uh, this is going to be used as, as a part of building it so that it'll work appropriately. So kind of, kind of, yeah, optimal dependencies in this case based on um, based on system D being uh, defined uh, as a part of the overall system by, by choosing to use system D instead of uh, uh, system five and init. And you'll notice we support both here uh, by specifying system D init uh, globally. Essentially, it will use this configuration instead of uh, the other one. Uh, but so it's kind of use flags, but use flags go a lot further than that. So it's, it's similar, but but a subset of the idea. It's much more targeted than that. I would argue use flags are somewhat simpler than than this. In the sense that they have broader, broader uh, reaching values, this is much more targeted. So, uh, but otherwise, like I said, we're going to break there for now. Um, and uh, when we come back, like I said, we're going to pick up at uh, when things go wrong, and uh, we'll go from there. And again, Tom King will be picking up the um, uh, the the, uh, the rest of the slides, uh, and uh, we'll go from there. I think at this point, I will probably throw a. Uh, a timer. Uh, Tom, do you want to take over and, and, and run a, a timer or do you want me to put the timer up? Uh, you're welcome, David. It's been my pleasure. Uh, and I'll be around if people have more questions to, uh, they need answering or whatnot. And again, if you, uh, if you want to ask even more questions, we've, we're going to have the, um, the social at the end of each day. That's a great time to ask lots of questions across multiple people.
something I always forget to, to mention is both Tom and myself, uh, amongst other things, uh, amongst uh, many years of experience that we've we've done lots of different things. And we're also instructors for the Linux Foundation. Uh, we teach classes on Linux kernel uh, code, um, embedded topics, uh, security, and uh, many other things, uh, tuning. Um, and there's, there's, there's courses on system administration, a bunch of other things. Uh, certainly, if you want to, uh, um, if you're all interested in, in further training beyond what we're talking about today, of course, we have many different courses and we're more than happy to, uh, to put you in, in, in touch with people that can, can set you up for, um, for training courses through our organization. But uh, uh, by no means, um, by no means uh, are, we the, are, are we the only option. There are, there are many other people at this, uh, at this conference that also provide similar, uh, similar services. But uh, I should I should mention that purely because my time is being paid by somebody to be here. 